Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander. I work at Pivotel. I work on Cloud Foundry Container Runtime, anchoring it. Hi, my name is Akshay Mankar. Uh, I used to work <laughs> on uh, the Cloud Foundry Container Runtime as an engineer. Uh, now I've moved to the closed source part of the PKS program. Uh, and this is our friend, Octo. Uh, he's the Octopus at Pivotal. Uh, he'll be helping us present this talk. Yeah, so we will talk about after operating Bosch packages and avoiding boring work. So important part that this talk is, will be most helpful for the Bosch authors. We expect you to know what Bosch list is, how you can develop it, and yeah, usually if you develop it, you'll see benefits. So what we will talk about, I'll talk about how, why do you need to do this? Probably you know, but we'll just recap a little bit. Then how you can do it and how we all are doing it. And we'll raise some concerns during our talk, what you can do better. OK, let's start. So I joined Piotr almost three years ago. And after deploying with Chef, Bosch was incredible. Bosch deployments are so nice. You can rep reproducibly deploy, de reproducibly deploy all the time. You can deploy it in different infrastructure, manifest a versionable, so new manifest, new version of your deployment. It's so nice, and core part of it is Bosch release. Bosch release contains all the packages. It's reproducible and it's self-containable, so you don't have to access the internet to deploy something. And this self-containability is done by blobs. So blobs help us to use some versions. It's Bosch packages that usually some other authors provide. So you upload them to the cloud and version them. You don't have to commit in your source code. And blobs are awesome. There's actually one problem. Problem with blobs is that, yeah, problem that we want to solve is this Bosch dance. I, I think all of you saw it. It's when something gets upgraded, you need to add a new version of blob, then remove old version of blob, then upload a new blob to the cloud, then commit, push it. Seems very easy. And yeah, it looks very easy. Unfortunately, not as easy. So here's just two months ago, I forgot to upload blob. That happens. It was, I added new blob, forgot to upload it. Or before that, I forgot to remove it. And I do these mistakes even with Octo help. What about you, Akshay? Uh, yeah, I. I, I did something, but I would I would very much prefer Octo to not hear it. It's it's really really bad practice. I I once uploaded Kubernetes version 1.6 as 1.7 while upgrading 1.6 to 1.7. So we all thought it got upgraded, but Kubernetes was still old. <laughs> and guess what I did? Why don't we have a commit message here? I was so embarrassed. I forced push on top of it. Please don't tell Octo. He'll probably kill me. Yeah. So that's, and that's even part of bigger upgrade thing, isn't it, actually? Yeah, uh, so that dance was small, but look at this bigger dance. How do you even know when, when upgrades are going to, when you have to upgrade a package? You have to wait for some team member to notice the, the package has updated, like they have released an upgrade, then they would, create the same old boring story in, in Tracker or whatever your project management thing is. You have to like find the old story, copy paste things, and be like, yeah, pff, update things. And then next thing, you have to convince your project manager, your team, that we need this upgrade. Then again, that conversation goes on. People go like, OK, we'll put it somewhere in the priority. It makes it to the top of the backlog. And then developer starts doing all those, these things. Again, you hope they don't make mistakes. And then pipeline runs the test, and then you ship it. So all of this, how do you feel about it, Alex? Mm, 
I personally like it with Octopus, we like it, but it feels repetitive and little bit boring, little, maybe a little bit, just a little bit boring. So yeah, so, some boring things. So first of all, this, find new version. It's relatively easy with, so we work on CFCR on Kubernetes, packaging in Kubernetes, and with Kubernetes it's relatively easy. Okay, new version of Kubernetes, there will be some post on hacking use or somewhere, like, okay, let's do it. But if we do some dependent package that no one cares that much, even Flannel or, I don't know, like some container images that we use, it just, you need to go somewhere, probably to GitHub and check the new GitHub release. And, okay, so you need to do it every day, once a week, it's just, yeah, it has to be procedure, it's quite boring. And that's one part of the boring thing. And the second thing is, yeah, development work, just, yeah. And since it's boring, we all do mistakes, even Octo does mistakes here, that, yeah. It can be just one script that can do this for you. And if it's boring, I, I'll ask you to do it, actually, yes? Obviously. As, as the doer of boring things, I would probably make more mistakes, or I'd just hire Terminator to do it. And if it's boring, they, it'll terminate it. Like, what's the point of doing this boring things, right? So, again, what would Terminator do? Terminator would be my bot. I call my bot Terminator. Uh, it would be like, it notices the upgrade, it'll create a story for me. And then maybe wait for us to prioritize it. And then we'll talk to PM, have that conversation. And then, then when, when it reaches the top of the backlog, Terminator will pick it up and do it, right? It's simple. Does this sound good? Like, if I don't do it and Terminator does it. Ah, yeah, so, okay, you saved your time. That's fine, but I know, I think that Probably Sean, who is here, he won't enjoy if I ask him every time to prioritize bump of new package, especially it will be like some very, very boring package. He'll ask me, why do you need to prioritize it? Can we like sneak it? Yeah, Not yeah, I think, I, think, I think you're right. You're right. Uh, and waiting is human, like we as humans like to wait for things and like make sure we're doing the most most important work that the customers would, would, would benefit from. And because our time is valuable, we prioritize things. But bots' time is not that valuable. No offense to any bots that are here. But their time is not that valuable. They are sitting, they're just, and also it's cheap because what is bots' time? It's some CPU time on some VM on cloud, right? It's cheap. So how about this new world where the bot will notice things and the bot will ship things? And we can go to Alps and hike. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that usually works good, but unfortunately, or fortunately, we work on uh, Kubernetes, and it has some, sometimes there are some problems happen. That sometimes they introduce some breaking changes, even in patch versions. I won't even talk about minor versions where contract may change, or something will happen, and if some new features appear, bot usually don't expose it because bot can't read release notes, so maybe let's automate this bot and make him eat, read the release notes? Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe like automating bots to read release notes. Sometimes I can't understand them. I don't know how to write code for bots to understand them. I would, I would much rather take some compromise here and bake in some flexibility in the bot. Right? Like, if I notice that bot has upgraded something wrong, maybe I would say, hey, how about you stop for a bit, don't upgrade things, and I will re revert the bot's things, right? Revert whatever changes bot's made. I have to make sure the bot is not super reckless and just doesn't, like, I revert bot's change and then bot goes, oh, you're using wrong package, let me upgrade it again. <laughs> so you don't want that. So let, let, let's, we, we should have a pause button in our bot. Like, it should be able to pause. There are other problems that we could, other ways to solve this is like Semver. It is the next best thing after reading release notes. Yes, release notes give you much more depth, in-depth detail, but if, if the packages you depend on religiously follow Semver, they would not break contracts in miners, or they would not 
make major changes in patches. So we could make bots listen to only minor changes or patch changes, depending on what, what package we depend on, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As a next step, we could also say that, hey, how about you don't push to master? Our master is super, uh, is supposed to be much more tested, much more stable thing. Send a support request. If bot sends a support request, we run a PR pipeline. We make sure everything works. Maybe have a person go through it and see. Maybe have a person go through release notes, check out deprecations, and see if there can be any minor enhancements they can make. Uh, so we could do all of those things. And not only we could do, we actually do. You can do these all things. So we do all the things. So we have several pipelines that you can access by this URL, or they will be linked to our Git repo. So for example, in Docker release, we just say Docker will only use supported version of uh, in Kubernetes. So we won't bump it much. We won't bump it higher. So we won't go on the latest. And in Kubernetes, it will use both. It will bump only for patches and send PRs, because PRs sometimes break things. And yeah, for for, for HCD and Flannel, just, just go ahead. If it's break, we will think what to do. And for Goline, we'll talk about it a bit later, because it's a bit more complicated. But how does it work underneath, actually? Can you yeah. tell us? How, how, how would the bot notice things? Like You might think it might be super complicated, but it's six lines of JSON in concourse. Thanks to concourse. Not JSON YAML. How dare I? Uh, sorry. Uh, so you just tell where the repository is. You just say, hey, use this access token. And there's this GitHub release resource, which comes with concourse, which can monitor releases uh, on GitHub. So whenever somebody makes a release, it will trigger a pipeline. Uh, and when the job gets triggered, what does the job do? It does exactly as I would do or any of you would do, but much more precisely. Uh, that is the blob dance, at least half of it, right? And then it, it will have to do some changes to the packages, because ideally what you want is you want your blobs to have versions in them. As in, if you have flannel, and your flannel file in the blob is just called flannel, you might get confused, like, did I really upload it or not? Did it really work or not? So for visibility, at least, you would ideally want flannel 0 0.10. And next, 0 0.11 comes. You would remove 0 0.10 and add 0 0.11. So because this name changes happen, you might have to change something in your packaging scripts and specs of the packages. And usually, those are very, very tiny things. Uh, you just basically change them, which said, or if it's more complicated, you could do things. Uh, our things are very, very simple, so we just use said. Uh, yeah. Now you would be like, how does it push code? Just like we do. <laughs> yeah. Just check out a branch and push, like, add everything and commit it, right? You could also make it push to master, but again, as we discussed, it's, it's up to the package on you, how comfortable you feel upgrading that package. Uh, and now now let's talk about the Golang thing that we... Yes, Bosch vendor package. So when I joined updating Bosch, languages was quite annoying. And until someone pushed me, I was like, no, maybe later. And unless there's something important, because I have to go in each release, update this blob, and even with automation, it's OK doable. But luckily, Bosch team heard us. Or maybe they had this problem as well. So they introduced this vendor package. What it will do, they actually maintain the release with package, with version package for languages and some and CFCLI. And when you pipe version release, they automatically add it to their release. And we can use it in our package with simple command, which will be on the next slide. So for example, for Golan, they support you can either follow the major version or follow the minor version. And you just run the same command again and again, which is this command. Very simple. If you want to know more, go to tomorrow's talk yeah, by Maya and Maria. It should be very interesting. And yeah, this is what we do in our pipeline. And I want to explain a little bit more here what's happening. So we get the version of Docker really, of 
Go release. And why we do this? Because we want to bump it in Docker, in Docker that we use for our unit tests. And that's what probably you should do as well, because sometimes on bumping of major packages, Go becomes more strict, and you don't want it to fail on your integration time, on your deployment time, but fail in your unit test time. So that's why you can, you should bump your versions in your Docker image that you use in CI. That's like a minor caveat. And one more interesting thing about vendor packages. Basically, all your releases, all your pa all packages in all your releases can be vendored. So as for us, for example, we can use kubectl. And we thought about extracting more small releases that will use kubectl so they can get this kubectl from our main release. And one of the benefits that you won't have to bump packages in all uh, Bosch releases, and other that it will be single blob, so less uploading, less compilation if you don't use pre-compiled releases, and yeah, it just works. And now, when we bump everything in our Bosch release, we finalize it. Next step is the manifest. So we want to bump releases in the manifest. It's very simple. Again, concourse pipeline. Code is not readable, but you can read from our repo. You just get the release URL and SHA and run Bosch interpolate command for the manifest and push it. As simple as that. So links to our CI and to our CI repo. Check our bump pipelines. They're very simple. If you have still have questions about it, we will we can answer them now, or we can answer them after the talk, or ask us in our Slack channel. And thanks for all these sources for our images. And have a nice CF Summit. And ha happy October. <laughs>